The reading this morning comes from the celebrated British poet David White. David White has had a career unlike most poets. He is both a published poet and a corporate consultant who explores the role of creativity in business. White has worked with large government organizations such as NASA and the Royal Air Force and with companies such as Boeing, AT&T, Toyota, and the former accounting firm, Arthur Anderson. The reading this morning is from his 1994 book, The Heart Aroused, Poetry and Preservation of Soul in Corporate America. As a poet, I could not foresee myself working corporate America. I was taught to view business, particularly big business, with suspicion. Still, when asked, I could not resist the first curious invitation to bring poetry to bear on certain aspects of change and creativity now being confronted in the workplace. I did expect to be at least a little corrupted by my immersion, but in the process discovered as much about my own arrogance as that of the American corporation. The poet was led to believe that they, the business people, were a faceless conformist hierarchy, busily destroying the world while doomed to a life of ineffable blandness. We poets, so the businessmen told themselves, were all either starving in garrets or living comfortably in academic ivory towers, dreaming away our lives, contributing nothing to the practical matters of the world. The whole of Western civilization, cultural tradition, is based on a primary interior struggle. The essential aloneness of the individual, coupled with a wish to be part of some larger body of people, a company, an organization, a church, a nation, a world, to achieve things that would be impossible to achieve alone. Bridging two impossible worlds, personal destiny and impersonal organization, we find ourselves standing in a half-dark twilight land between them both. We are all well aware how work both emboldens us and strangles our soul life in the very same instant. It reveals how much we can do as part of a larger body and how much the wellsprings of our creativity are stopped at the source by the pressures of that same smothering organization. Here's one story about a corporation. In 2000 and 2001, as a series of heat waves and wildfires struck the West Coast, the infamous energy company Enron manipulated the California power grid shutting down power stations, causing blackouts in the midst of heat waves, and gouging prices, ripping off consumers to the tune of $2 billion. In the documentary about Enron, recordings are played of conversations amongst the energy traders as they manipulated the power grid. Those recordings feature traders laughing and cheering on wildfires, yelling, burn, baby, burn, that's a beautiful thing, and cracking up, cracking up about stealing money from grandmothers. Here's another story about a corporation. Malden Mills is a textile company located in Massachusetts known for its signature Polar Tech synthetic fabrics, the type of fabrics that, you know, if you buy outdoor clothes at REI, um, you, you, your clothes probably have polar tech in them. In 1995, back in 1995, a massive fire completely destroyed the Malden Mills factory. Owner and CEO Aaron Feuerstein 
had a decision to make. He could have taken the $300 million insurance check and cashed out. He could have used the devastating fire as a convenient opportunity to move his company somewhere else, somewhere in the United States with um, you know, cheaper labor and fewer worker protections, or overseas to a third world country, as so many other clothing manufacturers had done. Instead, Faristein rebuilt a new, more environmentally friendly factory in Lawrence. Further, he guaranteed full salaries and benefits for all of his employees for months as the factory was being rebuilt. Years ago, I actually had the chance to meet and hear Aaron Faristein speak, and he spoke with great pride about his company and its role in the community and the importance of his Jewish faith the role his Jewish faith played in helping him to be an ethical employer and a businessman rather than an oppressive one. Uh, he said, it never occurred to me not to do the things that I did. A fire in California, and one corporation views it as a crisis to be exploited for billions in gain while literally laughing. We have it on tape, literally laughing at the suffering of the most vulnerable. A fire in Massachusetts, and one company CEO puts its workers and its community ahead of its bottom line, taking care of the hurting and the vulnerable. The sermon this morning is on the subject of corporations. Uh, the sermon was bought by church member Terry Baker at last fall's auction. Last fall's auction... Didn't the, organizer, didn't the organizer of that auction do just a fantastic job? <laughs> Isn't he smart and good-looking? There's, there's actually, I, I, I have the, there's a lot of jokes in here, and the first, the first service didn't really laugh, um, which, which um, it just shows, goes to show you that they, you know, I'm hoping, I'm hoping some more laughter this time, or else it's me. Um, so Terry bought the sermon and assigned me this topic. Terry, um, as I came to discover, spent his career in the business world, spent most of his career working for a pharmaceutical company. Now retired, Terry remembers his working life with fondness. He found his career to be meaningful, fulfilling, challenging, and personally rewarding. He remembers his coworkers with warmth and fondness and considers himself fortunate to have worked with such great folks. Terry contrasts his own personal, overwhelmingly positive experience in the corporate world with how corporations are often regarded in liberal communities, um, especially liberal religious communities, in which corporation is often regarded as a dirty word, a word synonymous with oppression, destruction, and plunder, a word sometimes even synonymous with evil. So that's what Terry asked me to preach about. And no, the irony is not lost on me that the person who paid the most for the sermon wanted me to speak in praise of capitalism. <laughs> I explained to Terry that when you buy a sermon at the auction, you are buying the right to assign me a topic. You're not buying the right to determine what I will say about that topic. <laughs> I'm not saying my conscience doesn't have a price, just that it's not for sale for a couple hundred dollars at the church auction. I remember one of my mentors once sold a sermon at, this is, this is the thing that Unitarians do, is they sell, they sell sermons. So one of my mentors once sold a sermon, and the person buying it asked him to preach on Scientology. Um, and the, the minister got up in the pulpit and said, it's a fraud. And, and, and he said that, he said so much in 2,000 words, but, but that was basically what he said. Um, and if I'm going to muddy the waters a little bit more, um, I'll also say that due to a communication breakdown that is entirely my fault, a communication breakdown that, that I own, um, my wires got crossed, and, and I actually am doing this on a Sunday where Terry can't even be here. Um, so, um, which, which I think of as a kind of like a socialism, it's like taking from one to give to all. Um, but really, what it, what it means is that is that I will have to give, um, I will have to uh, I will have to make amends and and preach on the other topic, the the other topic that he floated, um, the the one that 
I wanted to preach on even less than this one. So, um, which is karma there, I suppose. So before I go any further, I want to do, I want to do kind of a temperature check in the room. I want to find out where people kind of are. Um, I want to, how many people here, um, the show of hands, how many people here um, are or ha have ever been employed by a for-profit company, a corporation, as opposed to a non-profit? How many? So we get about, about half, a little bit more than half. Um, and I want to know also, if you're, if, you're willing to, um, if you're willing to admit, please be honest, how many people here have a negative association with the word corporation, that they hear it and they think something negative? So we have about, about a, little bit less, a little bit less than half, a little bit less than half. Thank you for your honesty. So why, why does a negative view of corporations exist and persist among us? I think it is for actually a myriad of reasons. Um, first. We associate the word corporation with the bad and destructive behavior of many corporations. We worry, and rightly so in my opinion, about the damage corporations do to our democracy with unchecked political spending and their ability to buy politicians and write legislation. We don't want Enron or ExxonMobil or Duke Energy writing our energy policies. We don't want big banks writing our monetary policies and banking legislation. We don't want Coke Industries writing our environment, labor, and tax policies. We worry, and rightly so in my opinion, about environmental degradation. We worry, and rightly so in my opinion, about labor practices here and in sweatshops and factories in the developing world. Further though, I think liberals tend to have a negative reaction to corporations because there is a concern about vast income inequality and wealth disparity and the damage this does to a democratic society. And it seems to me that corporations are often the drivers of this economic stratification. And there's also a concern about what happens when we privatize and add a profit motive to services that are ostensibly, ostensibly for public good. When we privatize prisons or privatize public education or privatize law enforcement, we risk introducing motives to these services that are something other than serving the public. And since uh, Terry spent his career working in pharmaceuticals, I might mention that pharmaceutical companies, not the one that Terry worked for, um, but others have made recent headlines um, that are quite bad. Um, recent headlines have been dominated by the so-called pharma bro, Martin Shkreli, who has become infamous for purchasing an HIV drug and increasing its price by 5,000%, earning him the title, the most hated man in America. Additionally, other pharmaceutical companies have recently come under fire for doing exactly the same thing. The pharmaceutical company Valiant is in the business of buying drugs and then spiking their prices. So Valiant now owns two drugs that are effective at treating a rare and hereditary liver disease. Since they purchased them less than two years ago, they've incre increased the price of one drug from $1,400 a year to more than $21,000 a year and the other from less than $900 a year to more than $26,000 a year. One doctor who specializes in the treatment of this disease has begun to recommend to his patients that they consider liver transplant as a cost-saving measure. That in order, if, if financially, financially you might want to think about a $100,000 liver transplant because that's gonna save you money in the long run over purchasing this drug the way it's priced. And so, which all of this is to say, these concerns about corporations are real and honest and significant. But it's worth asking the question, are these destructive and harmful behaviors inherent to corporations? Is it just a part of their nature? Or is the root cause of corporate bad behavior external or even accidental to the way corporations are structured? For-profit companies, uh, for-profit corporations we know are far from the only organizations capable of ethical misbehavior. Just this past week, a nonprofit that ran 70 after-school programs in Washington, D.C. 
with the ironic name DC Trust, announced its dissolution due to widespread and persistent mismanagement of funds. Governments certainly are more than capable of ethical failings, as we know, and so are universities. Any day now, we'll find out what the NCAA will hand down as punishment for the academic fraud scandal at UNC. I'm sure glad to work for a church. <laughs> Thankfully, we all know that churches are utterly and completely immune <laughs> from ethical lapses of any kind. But my, but my, but my point is, is that any any type of organ, it seems like any type of organization, is, uh, can can be a place for um, destructive and harmful behaviors. I went looking um, for sermons that UU ministers had preached on corporations um, and found one um, by the very controversial minister Davidson Lohr. Uh, his sermon is entitled, The Corporation Will Eat Your Soul. <laughs> and in it, he argues that corporations are, in fact, inherently evil, or in his own words, un-American, ungodly, inhuman, and disgusting. <laughs> he argues that all corporations, at least all corporations that are publicly traded on the stock market, by definition, by legal definition, have one purpose and one purpose only, which is to make money. He says that corporations do good when it pays to do good and bad when it pays to do bad, but never do good. They're incapable of doing good for just the purpose of doing good. That any good that a corporation does is an accident. I disagree with him to an extent. It seems to me that Coke Industries is very different from Ben & Jerry's. It seems to me that Halliburton is very different from Chobani, the Greek yogurt company in the United States whose owner, a Turkish immigrant, made the headlines this past week by transferring a major uh, percentage of ownership, a major ownership stake in his company to his workers, um, and thus um, kind of spreading the wealth in a very progressive way. Um, with those two examples, I wonder, is there, is there something about dairy companies and civic responsibility? Is it like if, you've, you, know, it's like if you make ice cream, you ha kind of have to be a nice guy, I think. Um, or take a company like Target. Target is one of dozens and dozens of corporations that have spoken out forcefully against HB2 in North Carolina. Um, and, and as a company has really been at the forefront in showing support for uh, the transgender community and for the LGBT community more generally, it's also been a company that has received a disproportionate amount of criticism and backlash from conservatives for doing so. And so do we really believe, do we really believe that Target's denunciation or Bank of America's denunciation or PayPal's denunciation of HB2 is done purely and entirely with an eye on the company's bottom line? Is it surely a marketing move, a play to get their company's name in the headlines and attract more consumers? I'm not cynical enough to believe that moral considerations did not play a role in the business community's outcry against HB2. Or, for that matter, Let's take a corporation that we love to criticize. Let's take Coke Industries. We know that Charles Koch, the CEO, uses the massinal, massive personal national, uses the massive personal wealth he has amassed as the head of a $100 billion company to get politicians elected who will pass legisl legislation like HB2 and other laws. Coke Industries also employs some 100,000 people, most of whom, I've, as far as I can tell, run factories manufacturing paper goods or, or manufacturing tech components or working on pipelines or on cattle ranches. And so this becomes an interesting moral question. If you work, if you work for Coke Industries, how far down the corporate ladder do you have to go to not bear at least some moral responsibility for the owner of the company. Certainly, I would have no problem saying that the executives directly under Mr. Koch bear some responsibility for the company's political involvement and enable it. But what about the guy driving the fork at the Koch Industries warehouse? What about the person on the assembly line or the person driving the truck? 
or the person cleaning the building? Is that, does that person, when, when they say with honesty and sincerity that I have a, a fulfilling and meaningful work life working among good people, how do we consider that? There's a story, I don't know whether it's a true or invented story, about a conference on business ethics where the keynote speaker was the executive of a company that manufactures bombs and missiles. An attendee at the conference went up to the speaker afterward and asked if he found it ironic to be speaking about ethics given that he manufactures munitions. The executive smiled and said, not at all, I just make them. The president and the Congress decide how to use them. It's been said, it's been said that companies are only as ethical as the people running them and that the, the difference that we get is really a, a difference in the character of, of the person who is at the top. If this is true, this probably ought to concern us. Recently, there have been a whole number of studies on psychopathology that have found that the CEO is the most popular profession for psychopaths and that CEOs and that CEOs have four times the rate of psychopathology as the population at large. But this also, this way of saying that, that it, it all, it, it's all up, to the, it's all up to, the, to the person at the top also should concern us because it pushes aside any sense of collective responsibility. I'm intentionally muddying the waters here. We live in a complex world a complex society where things often exist in shades of gray rather than black and white. And I think that there is within us a human drive, a human desire to insist on a kind of personal purity um, that in the end is not all that helpful, a kind of othering that isn't that helpful, uh, a, a myth that says, I am an ethical being and, and the, the destruction to the environment or the, um, or the monetary inequalities, that's all somebody else is doing. That's all that person over there, the ethical lapses, that's all that person over there, that's all that person over there. There's another kind of thinking, though, that says that we're all, that we're all, inter, that we're all interconnected and that we all kind of have, have skin in the game. That we all, all of us, you know, contribute in some degree in our lives to environmental degradation, even though we can take steps to diminish it. Um, that we all, you know, if we own a bank, if we, if we have a bank account, we're in that banking game. If we own a retirement account, if we own stocks, we're a part of that game. I, I actually know a UU minister friend of mine um, who believes that it is, he, he, he has the personal conviction that he believes that it is a sin to save money. Um, and so he does, not, he does not have a bank account or, or a retirement account. He believes that's participation in a, in a, in a sinful society. Um, and that type of person is, is, is quite rare. Um, that <laughs> Quite rare. I don't think. I don't think it describes. I don't think it describes anyone here. So, you know, we're we're part of it. It's, we're part of it. You know, seeing the enemy, and the enemy is us. I shared um, with a group of ministers that I'd be preaching on this topic, and the message that I got back from several of them um, was that I should avoid hypocrisy. <laughs> One, one minister wrote to me, I would trouble, I would trouble the notion. And, and do you get how that, that sort of the insisting on, on kind of this, this, this myth of purity, this myth that says, that says I am not a part of, of any of that, even though, that we, can, even though we can speak in, um, in strong ways against what we disagree with, we can also understand that, that, that we're, part of, we're part of the same system. We're not separate from that system. Um, one minister wrote, I would trouble the notion that nonprofits and socially activist organizations are better employers than the private sector. We claim highfalutin ethics, 
but often we treat our people worse than corporations do. And um, the horror stories, the horror stories that I've heard about working for nonprofits, um, they have they have nothing. They have are they are they are much worse than the horror stories that I hear about um, about most of corporate life. Another minister wrote to me, it's been my experience that corporations have a better track record than we do when it comes to diversity. And a third minister said, I have a confession to make. This third minister is not me, by the way, just want to let you know that. <laughs> I have a confession to make. At least once a year, I compose a letter to Google asking if they have need of a corporate chaplain and whether I might apply for it. <laughs> In the Christian tradition, the lectionary for this week, the lectionary is the, the text that um, within, within many traditions, the, the, the common texts that are read by Christians each week through the year, and they're kind of, they're specified. Um, the, the lectionary for this week includes a passage from the Gospel of John. Um, the words uh, that are included are words that Jesus spoke to his disciples, telling them, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. I do not give to you as the world gives. And so I want to leave by further muddying things. On one hand, I've said that this idea of, of purity, where we imagine ourselves as completely outside of systems and structures in the world, that, that, um, that kind of rightly uh, make us uneasy is, is not that helpful. And I'm going to come around and say the other side, too, which is that it is for religious people, for religious liberals, it is also a moral obligation to speak in criticism, to stand in, in, in criticism of structures that are, that are less than perfect in the hopes of a better structure. When Jesus says, I do not give to you as the world gives, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, I do not give to you as the world gives, um, believe that the statement is in, in stark contrast to the ethical standards of the society in which he lives. The, the, the peace of Rome, which is the peace of domination, the peace of um, empire with winners and losers conquered and conqueror, the peace of economic injustice with the rich and the poor. And so as the world gives, as the world gives, we ourselves, we ourselves are called, I think, to be uneasy and critical of what the world gives to imagine that there is a higher justice, a higher ethic, a higher way of the world as it might be. As it might be. And that is different and stands in judgment of the world that is. And that moral, ethical longing, that sense of justice, that, that hope is also, I would say, part of what it means to be a faithful religious liberal. In October, I'm going to have to preach another sermon. <laughs> Sorry, Terry. Thank you for being here, um, and thank you for listening to these words.